Hi there, Pastor Jimmy here, and I'm sitting here with Pastor John, and we're having a conversation here uh, with Mark Roberts. He comes to us from the Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary, and Mark's here for, with us for the weekend uh, for our Neurant Lectures Renewal Weekend. And, and Mark, there's been a lot of uh, conversations that have been had. Uh, we see them online, we see them in the newspaper, magazines, and even amongst uh, members of our congregation and leadership about the changing face of leadership that we see in our culture. Um, and, and as we look at that, it's, it's forcing the church itself to reconsider how we do leadership. And so with your role in, in the Max Dupree Center, where are you seeing the places that the church is being challenged when it comes to leadership? And what has been some of the responses that you've seen across the nation uh, mm. to this changing landscape of leadership? So where have I seen it? Where is the church being challenged with regard to leadership? By Absolutely. everywhere. Really, I mean, except for the churches that are dying that are not taking it on seriously. But I, I mean, it's the challenges of leadership in today's world are huge, and in churches in particular. So why, what? Uh, it was once, once if you opened the doors and had a good worship service and were nice people, your church would be okay and would even grow and thrive. And, you know, our denomination had churches with thousands of people with relatively little effort. Today is a different world. People don't go to church naturally. Many people are negative about the church. Church is not seen as essential to one's life. The way people anticipate leaders to function is different than when a day when, if you're the pastor, you're going to get respect. People are going to follow your leadership. Now we're in Times when we question leaders, we're asking harder questions of them. And I mean, so the whole church life and leadership is sort of turned upside down. You know, we're, as many have said, we're not in Christendom anymore. We're not able to just open the doors and be church. And so huge challenges. Related question, well, what do you see people doing about that? Honestly, I see a lot of churches not doing anything about it trying to sort of batten down the hatches to do business as usual. It used to be good when he did it this way. Probably it'll still be good. Or sometimes they try to make kind of superficial changes. Oh, if we just add a special service for the young people, we're great. Or if we call a younger pastor, we'll get a whole bunch of young people in and it'll all be great again. And, and those things are really not working. Where I see things that are encouraging to me it's where I see leadership of churches, by which I mean not just pastoral leadership, but the lay leadership along, leaders of churches saying, hey, this is new, this is challenging, this is hard. We don't know exactly what to do, but we want to learn, we want to be open. We're going to stretch in new ways, we're going to communicate in new ways, we're going to seek the Lord in new ways. And there are exciting things going in on in the church, even at the same time as others are sort of passing away. Okay, the, uh, going back as you were talking about not being in Christendom anymore. Yeah. Anymore, we had a bit of a conversation on that last night hmm. about the values in our in our public square, uh, in light of what our Christian responsibilities are, hmm. and how do you see those two things, the uh, postmodernism yeah. and our Christian values, impacting? one another yeah well you know there's going to be a tension I mean we who we are in Christ does not fit easily probably within any uh, human culture but especially today I mean you talk about postmodernism so the lack of concern for truthfulness or even belief that truth exists which we're experiencing to a, a significant extent in our in our government and those conversations now and conversations about the media but that was all that's all been done among postmodern thinkers for a long time that there really isn't truth and right. truth is just an exercise of power you know we have different convictions as Christians of course we believe in the one hand that Jesus is the truth that there is a a transcendent truth but because of that we actually believe that truthfulness is a is a high value and that it isn't just a matter of telling the story any way you like or, or denying that which doesn't fit for you. Uh, that we really want to be people committed to the truth. If that's 
if that's true of us, then, then we're going to stand out. We're going to be different. I would hope that in some ways that would be attractive to some. At the same time, I was just uh, speaking with a woman who was an executive in a pretty significant firm, and they pretty much flat out told her she had to misrepresent to the stockholders their financial picture. And if she stuck with the truth, then her, she would lose her job. So in her case, she was able to quit. Now that could be a really tough thing if she was, say for example, a single mom supporting a family that needed her income. I mean, right. these are hard things. So you don't want to simplify uh, what it means to live that out. That's just one example, but we're gonna be people who are committed to being truthful, to discovering what the truth is. I mean, you both preach and teach. You know, we, we, we need to work hard on what is the, the, the scripture really says. If we use an illustration that's purported to be true, we better check to make sure it is true and we get the story right. And that all contributes to, I think, being distinctive as truth tellers, truth affirmers. That's just one piece, but that is a significant piece. So we have a, a text that we're uh, looking at on Sunday, and so folks who are going to be watching this uh, will be on Sunday. They'll have just heard this text, and uh, we come across those words, Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions I like to ask, oftentimes as I look uh, across the, the landscape of my own life, but also uh, as I look at the church itself, I asked the question, is this what Jesus had in mind? Mm. Um, and so in thinking about Jesus as good shepherd, what is, what is Jesus saying to us, and where do we see an intersection with that good shepherd and our own mm. vocation call, but also leadership? Because mm. shepherd seems to have some sort of leadership aspect yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, what do you say Jesus is, has in mind for us as yeah. a church and as people, um, as the good shepherd? It's great. So just a little... Uh, linguistic stuff, the, uh, the Greek word for shepherd is the same word that would be translated pastor, say in Ephesians 4, where it speaks of pastors and teachers. And that, of course, in, in reference to human beings. So Jesus is the good shepherd, the good pastor. There are also human pastors. So linguistically, there's that connection that you're making. But one of the things to be said, and, and probably the most important thing to be said, is Jesus is uniquely the shepherd of the sheep, of his sheep. He is uniquely the good shepherd uh, for us as Christians and for the church. And that's always a good reminder to any of us in leadership. It's a reminder of whose church this is, whose flock this is. Uh, to the extent that you're a pastor of the church, John's a pastor of a church, you're the, um, you're the assistant pastor really, even if you're called something else. Jesus alone is, is the pastor. I think that's part of what we learn. I think that's important. You should probably say that one again. Yeah. I think all of us need to hear that yeah. again. Nice and clear. Well, and, and it's important, for, as I think of for your church. Like I need to hear that. Oh, you're in transition. You're looking for a new pastor. In a sense, that's true. Yeah. In a sense, mm -hmm. you got the same pastor you've had since 1863. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God. And it's important in terms of confidence and assurance. It's important in terms of humility for those of us who are given... The, the, the role of pastor, to remember that it's still Christ's church and he is the shepherd and I am the, the helper uh, uh, shepherd, if you will. But then from the other thing we can begin to work from is since we are participants in Christ's ministry, since we are, you might say, under shepherds, we learn from him what shepherding is all about. And, and this is, of course, in, in the text in, in uh, John. I mean, what does the shepherd do primarily? He lays down his life for the sheep. That's the primary calling of the good shepherd. So that reminds us who are wanting to be shepherds like Jesus, not that we literally give our life up and die, because he did it. We don't have to do that. But there's always a posture in, in Jesus-like shepherding of self-giving, of humility, of caring for the flock more than we care for ourselves. I know we all know this, but I think we here pastors know the challenge of this too, right? That there's, and we are challenged to be people who, who follow Jesus along this sacrificial road, not just as Christians, but in particular as pastors, as leaders who want to 
shepherd and care for the flock as Jesus had. And so for those of us who are inclined toward a bit of hubris or pride, who uh, love power, who, you know, we've got our stuff. I, I think Jesus, as the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, continues to remind us of the kind of people we're to be. You know, you mentioned I work for the Max Dupree Center for Leadership. So Max Dupree has been one of those business leaders who has held up the model of servant leadership. That we lead, yes, but we lead through the way we serve the people entrusted to our care. And so, yes, we are leaders, but we are leaders as servants, and we are servants as leaders. Max would say that's true if you want to be a have a thriving business, but he would also, as a person who loved the Lord, would have said that it has everything to do with who we are in Christ as well. Talking about generations here, and we've got a lot of, we've got, and this is, this is no secret, a lot of families in this community, but also across this country, are busy. I want to say that people have a desire to engage in community, and they have a desire, these are all heartfelt desires, mm. to, to be connected spiritually, mm. but they just can't act on that desire because right. of the schedule so right. so busy. What would you say to those folks? Mm. What would be some hopeful well, words that you could say yeah. to, the, to that audience, which is? Well, I'm pretty much talking to please. myself here, right? Yeah. Because I, which I probably all of us mm. that way. So a couple thoughts on that. I mean, one is to think critically about our busyness, which I realize when you're super busy, you can't do that. So you're gonna to have to find an opportunity to step back, to retreat, even to take an hour to think and reflect. But really, to, one hand, I think we need to look at our lives and say, do, do I really need to live this way? And, and again, I say I'm speaking to the choir. I mean, I, my wife and I regularly have this conversation about my work life. Right? Do, do I really need to do this, and if so, why? And so I think we need to not just assume that at least the quantity of busyness that we experience has to be the norm of our life. I think we can make some choices sometimes to simplify, and I think that's part of the answer. And I think most folk can do that, but it takes courage and conviction. Now, that's the one hand. Now here's the flip side. I think we also need to be creative about how we do community, how we do life more richly. And I'll tell you, in the last year I had an experience that I don't think I, I, I would have imagined having a few years back. I, I've been in a small group of some men. We meet monthly. We've had some really amazing engagement. A couple times in the year we've met in person, but mostly we meet in an online video conference. Mm. And it's really been awesome. None of us live close enough that we could really even get together. Uh, but it's been an amazing experience. And if you'd asked me even a couple years ago, what do you think about doing an online small group? Oh, come on, you know, and then I tell you, technology is ruining relationship. You gotta be with people. It's great when we're physically together. But because we can only be physically together a couple times a year, we're using the technology to to bridge that, it's actually been great. I know from my experience with other contexts that you can actually do a lot of praying through, you can tell I'm using my phone now, you know? For the rosary beads, I can tell. Which is, well, yeah, that's true, it's a little, but in a couple ways, I mean, one is, you know, you can send a text to people when you need some prayer, mm -hmm. but the other thing I've started doing is literally praying my prayer in the text or the email. Mm -hmm. So not just saying, Jimmy, I'm praying for you. Because yeah, you're in a thing, oh, your wife's giving birth. Let's just suppose that that might happen. Hypothetically. Yeah. And, and, Maybe a month ago. Right. Yeah. And so rather than you know, just saying, Jimmy, I'm praying for you, I mean, literally, I, I will pray my prayer in here. Dear Lord, please be with Jimmy and his wife and help their, the birth to go well. And, and yeah, it changes, changes the feeling. It though. changes the feeling. There's something very intimate about that. I just think, I mean, those are just two examples. My guess is if we, if we were a group of 20-year-olds, we'd probably be able to come up with a whole bunch of ways. I think we need to be really creative about how we do community in today's world, because I think there are some possibilities that will help us to make it work in the, in, in the craziness of our lives 
And at the same time, though, I'll end with going back to the first thing. And we need to find places to step back and think critically about how we're living because maybe some of that craziness really needs to be, um, you know. But I think there's some real positive ways to use technology mm -hmm. and also wed that to fulfilling our vocation. Yeah. And so I, I think your example of, of having a small group once a month online helps yeah. with that. What other uh, practical examples do you see within technology to help us move beyond the, oh, I hate technology, to this is really helpful? You know, I mentioned texting, but I'll give a very specific example from yesterday. So yesterday evening, my son, who's in grad school, went to his Christian fellowship group. They do a kind of a worship thing. And he shared his testimony about a way God had, has really touched him in his life. Now, I didn't know he was going to do that. He doesn't live with us, and we hadn't communicated. But after the meeting, he texted us. And he described what happened. And when I say us, my wife and me and my daughter, so our, our family. And, he, and first of all, it was just great to get it. I mean, it was such an encouragement. And, and then, of course, we could say, you know, that's fantastic. And way to go, Nate. It was, it, and that was a very intimate and spiritually edifying thing, right? I mean, that's just a little example. But, I mean, you know, so none of us are near each other. And yet, the technology enabled us to have a, a very significant connection in this time that was a very significant spiritual moment for my son. So, you know, that would be one way. I, I think there, there are other ways in which I think technology can help us. I mentioned the, you know, the devotional that we do. Uh, you know, a few years ago, you could never easily create a devotional that you could put into the hands of 5,000 people a day because it would have cost a bundle to mail it or you know it just you just couldn't do it now we can do it it gives us freedom and it gives people an opportunity not only to receive it but also fairly easy to add a comment or write back whereas you know if it's Oswald Chambers you can't really write back to the guy because of course he's dead now but there are certainly downsides to technology and it can certainly interrupt and and hurt things at the same time I think there's there's things we need to think creatively about and learn about. And, and again, this is actually where the church can learn from folk that tend to be younger than I am because they're living in this. They know some of these uh, opportunities in ways that I don't know them. And like the Instagram thing I said. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought about doing Instagram. Well, but even 500 years ago with Reformation, technology helped make that move forward. Huh? And it makes me wonder how many people were disgusted with the technology at that point of the printing press? Oh, there, there were, in fact, uh, many. In fact, it, each, it's interesting, you, you go back, there's a book called Hamlet's Blackberry. I can't remember the author's name right now. But it basically goes back into history and looks at key moments of technological innovation mm -hmm. and points out the, the ways in which that was disruptive and in all places the, the negativity that certain people did. So the, the thing I remember in the development of writing, um, uh, Socrates, the, the great Greek philosopher, was very negative about writing because he said if you write down what somebody has said, it'll lose the personal piece, it'll lose the nuance, you can't hear the voice. Writing is not good. So Socrates was against writing. <laughs> We know that because his stuff was written down by Plato, and now we have it. So, you know, but isn't that I ironic? So I think with each step of, of technological innovation, there are dangers, and there are positive yeah. Great potential. And I think we can, well, there's so much we have to learn as individual believers and also as churches in, in how we use that in a way that is edifying, in a way to reach our neighbors who might never come into the church, but they might connect to something that we're putting out there that's going to make a difference in their lives. One more question uh, for you as we're in the middle of the Lenten season. Yes. Uh, we're, we're moving towards Easter. You talked a lot about how, where we're at uh, today and, and the landscape and all that sort of thing. What would you share with us? 
uh, things that you think we might need to hear here mm -hmm. in our situation, our culture, our country? That's a great question. That might be a really tough question I just well, asked you. <laughs> yeah, but it's a really good question. So what is Lent about, first off? Lent is at its, at its heart meant to be a season of preparing us for Easter, but how does it do that? It does that by inviting us to take our, our humanity, our mortality, and indeed our sinfulness more seriously. So you know when Lent begins at Ash Wednesday, and you, you know, churches will impose the ashes, and you, know, you come from dust to dust, you will return. I mean, that's in a sense saying you're gonna die, right? You're gonna die. You're, you are a sinner, you are a mortal, you're gonna die. That's bad news. And I know some Christians get very uncomfortable with that. They want to like race to Easter, but you know, the resurrection and yeah, absolutely the resurrection. Thanks be to God. But sometimes there's, it's a good thing to stay a little longer with our humanness, our limitations, our mortality, our sinfulness, not to grovel, but really to take seriously our need for a savior. I mean, I actually know that the last couple of weeks, John, I think in both your sermons you talked, have talked about lament yes. as something that we need to step into. We're so afraid of that. And that you go to the Psalms and it's like, oh my gosh, this guy's like doubting God's faithfulness right here in the Word of God. What? Mm -hmm. You know, there's such incredible freedom in the Psalms to express lament, sadness, unhappiness, disappointment with God, doubt, all this stuff. It doesn't stay there, but what it does when you get that out, it, it, it opens us up. Whereas if I'm, I've got pain and disappointment in my humanness and my sinfulness, but I'm, I'm you know, clutching it inside, it's like there's no place for God to come in. And when we name it, it takes away some of the power. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think the, the great thing about Lent, then, is it, it's, a, it's a season that says, okay, let's, let's do this for a while. Now, we know the end of the story. We're not despairing because we know God's grace in Christ, but that gives us the freedom to pay attention to our limitations, to pay attention to our need for a Savior. You know, know the struggle of the flesh, to admit it together. Um, at, at the same time, to remember that Jesus was fully human and knows temptation. Every, every temptation that we know except he didn't sin, Hebrews tells us. And, and so we, we live in that in a way that does prepare us then for, a, for the extraordinary thing that God entered our reality and took all that on himself on the cross. And if you're more in touch with your limitation and your sin and your need, I mean then that I mean, there's transforms your experience of Good Friday, for one thing, and your, your, your sense of what it is that God has done for you by his grace in Christ. And then Easter is an incredible celebration of the victory, and it means so much more than if we just, you know, press on, as you say, with our busyness. So people celebrate Lent in different ways. Celebrate is not the right word. Acknowledge Lent. You know, some give up something, some take on something. For many Christians, it's a time to take on some additional service, sometimes additional learning. Whatever it is, the point isn't the stuff. The point is to put God at the center, recognize how much we need him, and be in that place, and, and, and stay in that place for a while.